Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the new church. Good to see you again. Sorry to uh, not have been here last week, but I was away, so it's good to be back. And um, thank you, everybody, who helped out yesterday with the work day and some people who came a little earlier to do that. Um, you'll see there's a big bin full of wood chips that just goes to show how many limbs and trees were, were chopped up, so it was quite a, quite a lot of work, and thanks, everyone, for doing that. Um, other than that, for the today, we have a bulletin there on the stand if you need that. And those who are with us online, welcome. It's good to have you too. Hope that you're well. And we will just begin our service today with our first prelude, our only prelude. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. Please turn to page 151 in your songbook for our first song. Together, see the Savior in, see the Savior in the temple, and you can go ahead and stand for the song. to all those who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Amen. Now come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Lord, it is good to be here with you and with one another. It is good to be able to hear your words spoken so we can have some perspective about what life is about and how we are to live this life both planning for happiness now and happiness to eternity, knowing that is your goal for us. Lord, help us to learn from your word today how we can make changes in our life that help us to be more kind, more generous, more loving, and more clear in purpose. And Lord, please help heal this world that's suffering, help to bring peace and hope and love. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O oh Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. Right, you ought to be seated, and anyone who wants to come up for your talk, you're welcome to do that, or you can stay where you are. But, morning, children. We're going to talk about one of the Lord's miracles. And um, do you know what a word miracle means, what that is? Kind of something that's extraordinary, something that something we couldn't do, I'm sure, something that the Lord has the power to cause in our life that's amazing. And this story is about the Lord feeding, it says 5,000, but it was much more than that because those days they just counted the men that were there. But if you added the women and the children and everybody else, it was probably more like 10 or 15 or 20, who knows, many thousands of people. So lots and lots of people were gathered around. The Lord was there teaching them. And I want you to focus on the difference between what the Lord thinks should happen at the end of this and what the disciples think could happen. This is from the Gospel of Mark. It says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep 
not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So denarii is a type of money, and it's supposed to be about a day's worth, a day's wage. So if you worked all day long, it's what you would have got paid for that. So we're saying we need 200 denarii to feed that many people, that, many, that much bread we'd have to buy. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of the fish. And now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. So did you notice anything miraculous occur in that story? something unusual. <laughs> so if we had five loaves of bread, I, I figured two was enough to demonstrate what we're talking about today. So we have two loaves of bread here. We could probably feed us, perhaps. Maybe we would still be hungry, but there's enough to probably to feed all of us in here. But there were thousands and thousands of people there, and they were all hungry because it was getting to be late. It's past dinner time. And the disciples said, you better send everyone away because they're not going to be able to get any food because there's nothing here to eat. The Lord had a different idea. So I want you just to think about the difference between the disciples' view of things and the Lord's view of things. The disciples probably, like a lot of us, think, oh, well, the Lord's job is to teach us truth, like he was doing with the people that were there. Tell them what's true, and when that's done, that's all that the Lord can do. Maybe he can heal a few people, that kind of stuff, do some miracles, but um, that's all that the Lord can do for us. The Lord said, hey, wait a minute. Um, why don't you see what kind of food we have here? So they found out that they had five loaves of bread and two fish, morning. And they said, well, let's get that, and we can feed everybody. So he took it, and he blessed it, and they passed it out, and they had so much left over, they were able to fill up 12 baskets full of the fish and the bread, there was so much left over. So what's the difference between how the Lord sees things and how we see things? That's what I want to think about today. I think sometimes we think, well, the Lord cares about whether we'll get to heaven, which he does very much, and whether we're happy, which he does very much. But we don't think he cares a whole lot about all the little details of our life. Do you think the Lord cares about all the little things that happen? Like, what did you have for breakfast today? What did you have for breakfast? Did you have breakfast? Yeah? Good. Did you sleep last night? Anybody get some sleep last night? Yeah? You were able to get here. I don't know if you walked or rode a bike or took a bus or drove a car or whatever it is. You got here, so that was a detail of, of your day. You have clothes to wear. I see everybody's got their clothes on, and that's good. Little details of our day. But there's so many things that we don't often think about and thank the Lord for them or ask the Lord's help for them. So what I think about is the disciples thought, well, the Lord's job is done. He, he taught them some things, and now we should send everybody away. But the Lord said, no, we can feed them. We can care for them. We can do so many things to help each other out. So I would think about, a lot of you are starting school, I think, soon, right? And you might think, well, I wonder if the Lord cares about school and my school. And I'd say, yeah, he cares very much about that. He cares about whether you have what you need. He cares about whether you're learning or whether you're happy or whether you have friends or whether you have a place to, to sit and all these little details of your day and of your life. And if you think about all the details, little bits of things that happen in any day, there's so many of them. And the Lord cares about each and every one of them. The Lord actually said something very unusual. He said that, why are you worried? Because, you know, guess what? 
Every hair on your head is numbered by the Lord. The Lord knows how many hairs are on your head. Do you know how many hairs are on your head? I had more than I did. I mean, I had less than I did a long time ago, but I still have some. So the Lord doesn't have to keep track of as many, so that's maybe easier. But think about that. If the Lord says you have, if the Lord knows how many hairs are on your head, that the Lord is concerned with every little detail of your life. And to me, that means that I ask the Lord for help in all the different ways, all the different parts of my life. When I wake up, when I get ready for school, when I have breakfast, when I have lunch, when I'm talking to friends, when I'm walking outside, every little part of my life, the Lord is there and cares about it. So, you know, to me, that means I can pray all the time. I can say, thank you, Lord, that I was able to wake up this morning, that I was able to have something to eat, that I was able to go walk with my dog, that I was able to drive in a car that had gas in it, that I come and see people, and all the little things. Just You can find yourself saying thank you a lot during your day. And when things come up that are difficult, to say, okay, Lord, I know you're here. I may not feel it. I may feel afraid. I may feel worried. Those are feelings that I don't often connect with you, but I know that you're there. Help me to find a way through this. Help me to find peace in this. Help me to learn. Okay? So the Lord can do anything to help us. This story is a great example of, hey, we only had five loves and two fish, but look what the Lord was able to do in this case. So anything you're struggling with in your life, anything you're concerned about, anything you need help with, ask the Lord. I'm sure the Lord can help you. It may not be the way that you thought, just to be clear, but the Lord can help you to get through it. Okay? Well, thanks for listening. I hope that those of you who are starting school, that everything goes really well for you and that you have fun and you learn a lot. And uh, let's sing our next song. Please stand and join us in singing um, on page 93, In the Secret. for 
bow your heads for a blessing on the children. Lord, we pray that you guide your children to help to know you and to know that you're always there in every moment of every moment of their life, in every detail and all the big picture things as well. Help them feel safe and guarded and protected by you and your angels. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. I invite you to be seated and children, you're welcome to Stay with us or please go outside. We also have a teen leader if there are any teens that want to do that today. And we will hear from our from Cece for our next reading. Thank you. I'll be reading from 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 22 to 30. Afterward, the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Strengthen your position and see what must be done, because next spring the king of Syria will attack you again. Meanwhile, the officials of the king of Syria advised him, Their gods are gods of the hills. That is why they, are too, they were too strong for us. But if we fight them on the plains, surely we will be stronger than they. Do this. Remove all the kings from their commands and replace them with other officers. You must also raise an army like the one you lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, so we can fight Israel on the plains. Then surely you will be stronger than they. He agreed with them and acted accordingly. The next spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. When the Israelites were also mustered and given provisions, they marched out to meet them. The Israelites camped opposite them like two small flocks of goats, while the Syrians covered the countryside. The man of God came up and told the king of Israel, this is what the Lord says. Because the Syrians think the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valley, I will deliver this vast army into your hands, and you will know that I am the Lord. For seven days they camped opposite each other, and on the seventh day the battle was joined. The Israelites inflicted 100,000 casualties on the Syrian foot soldiers in one day. The rest of them escaped to the city of Aphek, where the wall collapsed on 27,000 of them. And then Hadad fled to the city and hid in an inner room. Thank you. All right, I have two readings to share with you from the Heavenly Doctrine for the New Church from Secrets of Heaven. This is 8478. 
It should be recognized that divine providence is overall. <clears throat> that is, it is present within the smallest details of all and that people in the stream of providence are being carried along constantly towards happier things, whatever appearance the means may present. Those in the stream of providence are people who trust in the divine and ascribe everything to him. But those not in the stream of providence are people who trust in themselves alone and attribute everything to themselves. Theirs is a contrary outlook, for they take providence away from the divine and claim it as their own. It should be recognized also that to the extent that anyone is in the stream of providence, they are in a state of peace. And to the extent that anyone is in a state of peace, by virtue of the good of faith, they are in divine providence. These alone know and believe that the Lord's divine providence resides within every single thing, indeed within the smallest details of all. And then from 3854, it says, from this it may be seen how far someone errs who believes that the Lord has not foreseen and does not see the smallest individual things with us, or that within the smallest individual things the Lord does not foresee and lead, when in fact the Lord's foresight and providence are present within the tiniest details of all the smallest individual things with us, and in details so tiny that it is impossible to comprehend in any manner of thought one in many millions of them. For every smallest fraction of a moment of our life entails a chain of consequences extending into eternity. Indeed, everyone is like a new beginning to those that follow. And so every single moment of the life of both of our understanding and of our will is a new beginning. Amen. Here in our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. That box on the, the windowsill there, Willard, if you press the power button on that box, that will help. Sorry. Thank you.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I've been fortunate enough in my life to do some traveling around the world and been to South Africa twice. And it's a very beautiful country. And landing there is a beautiful experience because you come down, often cloudy from my experience, coming into a lush place. It's very green, very beautiful. There's rolling hills, and as you descend further, you see more details. You see lovely homes and swimming pools and beaches, and you get a little closer. And notice in some places, there's lots of what seem like shacks all very closely put together. And then recognition, that, oh, this, this is a shanty town that I'm seeing. And like, oh, wow, look at that. And then get the airport and get in a car and drive and you see them closer and drive by these, these shanty towns that are just made, they're just really shacks made out of um, tin and cardboard. And there's sort of a creek next door, which is the toilet. And there's not even one blade of grass or tree to be seen anywhere in these. And it goes on for miles as you drive by in one city. It's an interesting experience because when you're up high and you have that perspective, everything looks absolutely wonderful and beautiful. And you get down into it, and it becomes a little bit more clear that, oh, it's not quite what I thought. Where's the Lord in all this? You sometimes ask yourself when you see the details of life because they're a little bit messier. You can see how some people are drawn to just wanting to be on the mountaintop, being separate from other people, and to meditate and pray and, and not get involved in the messy world that we are involved in. As you do, you get down in it, it's messy, it's imperfect. And it's harder to see God there in the chaos. So with that in mind, you can see the value of coming to church, hearing the Lord's word read, hearing the music in a beautiful place like this, and meditating and being involved in prayer because those lift our thoughts up to higher places where we can feel and experience the beautiful things that are around us, to rise above the schedules and the arguments and the cleaning and the bills we have to pay and the annoying details of life. And so sometimes we need to raise ourselves up and see the Lord again. Because it can be a challenge when we're bogged down in all the details of our daily life to feel like the Lord is present. So how do we carry that vision that we experience, that higher place, that mountaintop into our daily life? Well, religion is often thought of as a head game, right? Where it's what's in your mind is what matters, what you know, what you believe, what your faith is. And many churches teach that it is your faith that saves you all by itself. It's faith separate from a life of charity, a life of love. Or that our spirituality is all about meditation alone, that just getting there and being at peace and just getting that mindfulness is all that it's about. But listen to the Lord's two great commandments. They give a little bit of perspective about this. It says, and the two great commandments are, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's like, this is what religion is all about. These are the two things that everything is going back to. It says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's that word in there that to me says this is this is a lot of work. I have to love the Lord with all my strength, every bit of my life, every bit of my power, all of my thinking. 
all my heart, all of my soul. And it's going to take strength. It's going to take a lot of my life, a lot of my attention to obey these commandments. So you look at some of the religions of the world, and for today's purposes, think about the Judeo-Christian culture, and rituals have always been powerful and important. Think about the nation of Israel, how many external rituals they had to perform in order to be obedient to God's commandments. They had to do sacrifices each day, a variety of them often. They had to keep Passover to mark their freedom. They would have jubilees and feasts and weddings that sometimes would last a month. And cleansing rituals involving most, not only their bodies, but their cooking and so forth. So a lot of details involved. You figure, like, how do I keep up on all of those things if I'm going to be a good, good uh, Jewish person? And think about Christianity. Christianity has less of those sorts of things or fewer of those kinds of things. We have a baptism that we're supposed to do to be christened as a sign of our faith in the Lord. Some people believe that if you aren't baptized, you can't go to heaven. Like, it's that important to some people's thinking. Or Holy Supper, that communion where you come forward and eat the bread and the wine is something that we do externally that represents something powerful within. Or a marriage ceremony. In a marriage ceremony, there's often rituals involved, like the sharing or exchanging of rings and, and um, the vows and the party to the sort of celebration of it. Or we have confirmations and those sorts of things in the Christian religion. Why do we have those? Well, because there's power in externals. There's power in doing and acting and not just thinking about what you're doing. The writings for the New Church say this, which I think is interesting. It says, it is according to angelic wisdom that unless the will and the understanding that is affection in thought as well as charity and faith clothe and wrap themselves in works or deeds whenever possible, they're only like something airy which passes away or like phantoms in the air which perish in that they first become permanent in you in a part of your life when you practice and do them. So it's saying, you know, all this thought about being religious, all this thought about being spiritual doesn't really do anything. It sort of vanishes if we don't actually act on it in some way. It's not through some action, it disappears. So it's not just wishing well for others, but doing well whenever possible. So what we do and what we intend matter. Another sort of skewed belief is that um, rituals are all that matter. For example, church attendance is all that matters as long as I'm there every week. I'm sort of absolved of all the, the sinning I'm doing during the week because I made it to church and, and checked that box, right? Or if I take the communion or if I give to the church, if I commit my time or my money to the church, or if I get baptized, these are made the most important things, and they can shut down opening up our spirit, too, because we think it's really just about obeying those external things. I'll do the act, and I'll be saved regardless of my state of mind or my intentions. Well, religion and spiritual life are about a marriage of the two. They're about not only what we do and what we think, it's about both of those being joined together in life. What do I believe to be true, and what am I doing about it? Without, one without the other is empty and not real. So it's interesting, at the end of the Lord's life on earth, Jesus' life on earth, one of the things that he did with his disciples to sort of reinforce this is they were coming together, they were having the Last Supper, and then the Lord washed all of their feet, an act of service to all of them. He got down on his knees, took a towel, put it around him, washed all of their feet, and he said, go and do likewise. Do this for each other. This is what religious life is about. It's being of service to other people, not looking at their faults, because we know feet are not the most beautiful part of ourselves, right? And they're, if, in that culture, they were often very dirty because they wore sandals. And so getting down there and being with people in that way was an example that the Lord said of how to live. And he says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. If you know them, you're not happy. If you do them, you're happy. And we shared the story of the feeding of the 5,000. There was a multitude that was following the Lord, and he had taught them, and it says he was moved with compassion for them because they were like 
sheep without a shepherd. And so the Lord taught them. And then when it was over, the disciples, as we talked about with the children, said, well, it's time for you to go back because there's nothing we can do here for you. They didn't think, well, this is the creator of the universe here. Surely he can do something to help. That wasn't their thought. Their thought was it's time to, to send them away. Well, the Lord taught them. He gave them food for their soul, for their mind, for their life, but he also gave them food for their body, for their hunger. The Lord says, we shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's both of those things. It's what feeds our mind, but also what feeds our body, all parts of our life. And Sisi shared a story about the Syrians facing the children of Israel, which is an interesting story because the Syrians were beaten by the children of Israel. And they were beaten because they fought in the hills, they thought. Well, their God must be a God of the hills because they beat us when they were in the hills. But if we fight them in the valleys or in the plains, then surely we can defeat them because their God can only function, only has power up here. <laughs> Doesn't have any power down in this lower part of life. So they planned an attack in the valley. Even though the children of Israel were severely outnumbered, they decimated the Syrian army. The hills picture our inner life, the life of our spirit, and the valleys our outer life, our day-to-day -day life. And our temptation is to think that the Lord's area of jurisdiction was only within our mind and in our spirit. We might think, well, God's laws aren't really practical when it comes down to you know, living in the world. They're more about how do I just what I think about, what I intend, and so forth. It's like, yeah, the, God's the God of the hills, but not really of the valleys. So I'll, I'll read, and I'll study, and I'll listen to sermons, and I'll pray, and those sorts of things. But I won't live by the teachings. But we know we've got to do both. We've got to shun evils as sins in our life. We've got to shun, shun our intentions that are negative, our thoughts that are negative, and ask the Lord to be with us on all levels of our life. And the Lord speaks to this, and he says, you know, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And I think about that, and I think, ah, eh, that can't be true. Why would the Lord care about that? He's got much bigger things to worry about than how many hairs are on my head. And look, there goes another one that fell off. They just, you know, you brush your hair, or you just put your hand through it, and they just they tend to fall off, right? That's what happens. <laughs> and the Lord's keeping track of all that. I was saying, yeah, I do. I keep track of all those things. And it says, divine providence is over all. Okay, so it's over everything. That is, it is present within the smallest details of all. Now, I know we've heard that passage read many times about divine providence, but it's in the smallest details of all. And it says that people who are in the stream of divine providence are being carried along constantly towards happier things, whatever appearance the means may present. Those are in the stream of providence who trust in the divine and ascribe everything to him. Now notice that the Lord's in all the details and people that are in the stream of providence, those who are in the state of peace, they ascribe everything to the Lord. You might ask yourself that question as you think about this, like, well, what do I think the Lord's, what parts of my life do I think the Lord's involved in? What areas of my life does he really care about this issue that I'm facing? Well, it says he's in every detail. And if I really trust the Lord, I ascribe everything to him. But then it says further, but those not in the stream of divine providence are people who trust in themselves alone and attribute everything to themselves. So in other words, it's all up to me, which is a huge burden, <laughs> if you ask me, to think that everything, I have to figure it all out by myself. And it says, their outlook is a contrary outlook because they take providence away from the divine and they claim it as their own. In other words, I have to make things work. I have to make it all go okay. I call that stress. <laughs> That's called stress when you think I'm in charge of everything and I have to make it work out. It's up to me. The writings say again, divine providence resides within every single thing, indeed within the smallest details of all. The Lord's foresight and providence are present within the tiniest details of the small, listen to this, it says, present within the tiniest details of all the smallest individual things with us in the details so tiny that it's impossible to comprehend in any manner of thought. 
in one in many millions of them. It's like you can't even comprehend how many, how intricately the Lord is involved in your life. And every fraction of a moment of your life involves a series of consequences extending to eternity, like every fraction of a moment. Well, what if I go this way? <laughs> All right, what if I went that way? I like we got to mess around with the providence and see if we can kind of beat the system, right? But the Lord's invo Lord is involved in all of those things. And if we don't buy into that, in those tiny, that the Lord is involved in all those particular details, then what's left? What's left is that we have to be in charge of it. We have to control it all. We have to figure it out. So we struggle to do that. And I think we struggle a long time to do that until we get broken down so much by the pain and hurt of that attempt that we recognize, you know, Lord, I can't do this. This is not my job. <laughs> this is not what I'm responsible for. The writings even say this. It's quite stupid, that's a quote. It is quite stupid to think the divine only governs things universally and not particularly. Of course, the Lord's involved in the big picture, but also the small things of life. There's more passages that say the same thing, so I won't read them, but the same thing. Details, 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 particular, my tiniest details, all things. So, this week we were in Florida on a vacation, and uh, we had a flight scheduled for 8 o'clock out of Miami, and we had our checkout from our VRBO was at 10 a.m., so we had some time to sort of waste, you know, let's go here and linger and go here and linger for a while. And we went to a restaurant to eat and play some cards and sort of kill some time till it was getting closer. And I think it was about an hour and a half till we had to go to the airport and drop off the rental car. And I got that little ding text that says, oh, your flight is canceled. Like, oh, <laughs> huh. So, all right, so, you know, being someone who reads this stuff on a regular basis and think, okay, the Lord's involved in all the details of my life and divine providence is leading no matter what it may appear like. And I'm like, how good am I going to be at trusting in that at this particular moment? Well, I have to say I was stressed <laughs> and I, I was praying while I was calling the airport, the airline and saying, all right, what can you do for us? Um, we had a wedding to go to the next morning at 8 o'clock and we were supposed to arrive at 11, so it's late enough already, but they said, well, the next direct flight out of Miami will be Monday. I'm like, that's not going to work. Um, we can get you a flight tomorrow. You'll fly out of Miami, then you'll get to Orlando, and you'll sit there all day long, and then you'll fly, and you'll get back here at 11 o'clock Friday night, missing the wedding and the reception and everything. It's like, that's not ideal either. Like, what if we, can we get the flight out of Orlando tonight? Yeah, but I can't get to Miami. Well, I can't get to Orlando on a plane. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just drive my rental car there, drop it off, and fly away. Simple. So that's what we scheduled. We scheduled a flight out of Orlando. And so I thought I should probably call the rental car company to see if this is OK. So I call them up and say, yeah, you can do that. It'll be an additional $1,600 to drop the car off there. So they're like, oh. Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to do that. Um, anything else we can do? So this is where the prayer is, you know, you're doing double time in your head. I'm praying while I'm negotiating and um, breathing. And uh, no, that's nothing we can do about it. Really? Nothing at all? Nope. You know, okay. Try not to be resentful. Um, so we tried to figure out what to do. So we're sitting there, what should we do, what should we do? We've either got to go to the airport in Miami now and figure this out, or we should just bite the bullet and drive to Orlando. So we decided we're going to bite the bullet and drive to Orlando, and we'll, hopefully we have enough time to make it there. It takes three hours to get there, and the flight leaves at, I think it was 7.30, maybe. Um, so we headed off thinking, well, $1,600, it's too bad. That's a lot of money, but here we go. Um, and then... That's a detail. And then my daughter and her boyfriend said, you know what, here's an idea. What if we drop you off in Orlando and drive the car back to Miami? His father is a, is a pilot, 
he could get us flights out of Miami, probably, hopefully, maybe. <laughs> and uh, we can drop you off, and then we can get the car back to Miami and won't have to pay that fee. And somehow, miraculously, that all worked out. Thank you. Um, but I tell you that story to tell you that there's a lot of details that go into life, right? In any moment of life. And when things get thrown up in the air and you're faced with chaos, what are you going to, who do you trust in at that moment? And I have to say that I, I probably could have been less stressed than I was. Um, wasn't perfect. I was very dry in my throat. I'm, I'm feeling dry right now, retelling the story because all the moisture was sucked away from the vital organs under that stress. But on the way to Orlando, I also had to pray to the Lord for forgiveness because I might have broken some of the speed limit laws to get there. But um, I think praying all the time as you go along and trusting that, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can trust the Lord is there. The Lord is leading us. The Lord knows what's, what's going to happen. And there is a way through. My wife said something on the way to the airport, which is this. She said, everything is figure outable. I know it's not a real word, but everything is figure outable. And I think I had to ask her again what she said, because I was like, you said something that I thought was notable. And I thought, yeah, everything's figure outable. I think that's an important lesson, too. That everything is figure outable. The Lord can help us to figure things out if we work with Him. The Lord is with us every moment of every moment. The Lord is God of the hills and the valleys. So I, my invitation to you today is to bring everything to the Lord. And I don't just mean the big stuff, but everything. Does the Lord care about the details? Yes, absolutely. And we have to recognize that maybe the details we want aren't the details that are best for us, and maybe we won't get that. And maybe, you know, it'll turn out all right, right? The psalmist says this, Psalm 37, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. It's a beautiful image. Amen. Can we pray for a moment? Lord, we pray that you be with us in every moment of our lives and help us to recognize that you are there, holding us by the hand, guiding us, leading us towards happier things, no matter what it may appear. And help us to know that you have our welfare in mind and that you are leading us through all of the challenges, through all the good things, through all the hard things. Help us to trust in you. Help us to read your word so that we know that you're leading us and help us to pray to you so that we work together. Thank you, Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to stand for the closing of the word. remain standing for our final song together. This is My Father's World on page 187.
please be seated. Posted it for you. Hold on to me as we go, as we roll down this unfamiliar road, and all of this wave is stringing us along, just know you're not alone. Cause I'm gonna make this place your home Settle down, it'll all be clear Don't pay no mind to the demons They fill you with fear The trouble, it might drag you down If you get lost, you can just know you're not alone Cause I'm gonna make this place your home Ooh, ooh, You can 